All right, let's go and get started. Um, let me get the lights and whatnot adjusted. Let's see. There we go. All right. Um, so let's go and get started. Uh, a few quick announcements. So number one, your homework two is due today. So if you haven't already done so, go ahead and start to uh, pass those on up. Um, I'm going to go ahead and assign homework three uh, right now. So homework three is going to be our first homework on Excel, and we're going to spend a, a fair amount of time today just exploring some of the basics uh, with Excel. Um, most of this you'll be able to do uh, by the end of business today. Um, we're also going to have an in-class exercise uh, next time that sort of rounds out the rest of the assignment. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and start to pass this out. So get one there. Um, and we'll have uh, qu probably quite a few assignments on Excel just to, you know, uh, go through all the different aspects, things like plotting and things like, you know, the programming stuff, if-then statements, things like that. If you're just coming in, no worries. I'll uh, I'll get handouts to you um, when it's all said and done. Keep in mind, everything's on Blackboard as well. In fact, you probably want to go ahead and log on Blackboard if you haven't already done so. Um, there's a, a there's an Excel file on Blackboard that we're going to utilize uh, to do some conditional formatting stuff today. Okay. All right. So a few other quick announcements. The so number one, uh, SAME ASC. They're, um, they're hosting their uh, next meeting on uh, Tuesday at 6 p.m. in 2241. So that's the computer lab, uh, one floor down on the opposite end of the, uh, the, the main atrium. Uh, if you're interested in being involved with the Steel Bridge competition and going to the Virginia's conference, it's probably a good idea to, uh, to go because I know that's going to be one of the big items uh, for discussion. There's also going to be, a, we're going to have a guest, uh, Jimmy Riston from the DOH is there. So if you're a civil engineer and you're interested in uh, maybe getting a, an internship or something with the DOH. Um, he's probably going to mention it, and it would probably be a good idea to at least uh, uh, show up. I mean, there's pizza, so, you know. Everything else didn't matter but the pizza. That's what, that's what sold you. Now, now we're coming. Okay, um, one other thing. So I'm sure you all are aware um, that us engineering faculty uh, tend to like our assignments on engineering paper, and it's not the cheapest thing in the world. Uh, Theta Tall is conducting a, a fundraiser. Uh, they're selling a, a, a bunch of engineering paper. They're actually really trying to unload their, their inventory. They've got quite a bit of it. They're selling one pack for, poor, uh, for $4 and two packs for 7 but they're willing to negotiate. So um, uh, if you're interested, contact Andrew Mays. He's the president of Theta Tall. His email's right there, Mays113 at Marshall. And uh, uh, if you're interested, uh, give him a, a shout out. Sound good? All right. So today, um, we're, we're essentially done with uh, everything that we're going to do in class for the Casio. And what we're going to be exploring today is the use uh, of Excel. So we're going to be uh, spending a fair amount of time just getting used to it, uh, going through some pretty basic fundamental stuff. I've got some stuff on Blackboard where we can do some conditional formatting. I see some folks have already started to, uh, to download that. And then we'll go ahead and, uh, uh, and get started. So. Uh, let me, uh, let me get the sign-in sheet passed around, so here, I'm going to give that to you. You can get that passed around for me. And then we'll go ahead and get started. All right, so I'll say this, not to sound like, a, like I'm trying to, to sell you on, on spreadsheets or like I'm a marketing agent or something, but by and large, spreadsheet software, software like Excel, is one of the most commonly you know, used programs, not just in engineering, but in, in professional life uh, in general. I'd argue that you know, regardless of, of being an engineer, if you're an accounting major, a nursing major, a teacher, you know, what have you, you get a college degree and you um, use that college degree in your profession, I think there's a very high degree of probability that you're going to use a spreadsheet at some point uh, in your career. Um, spreadsheets and spreadsheet software like Excel and Google Spreadsheets and things like that, they're available. They're all over the place. So it makes files very easy to transfer. You know, if I've got some 
data or some calcs or some, some stuff I want to send to another engineer or another individual, and I put it in Excel, there's a, 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 not just a high degree of probability, there's almost a certainty that they're going to be able to, to access that information. Um, one of the things about spreadsheets is they're, they're very, very visual. You know, I mean, we're going to use um, MATLAB later and some other uh, programming languages. And yeah, don't get me wrong, they're, they're powerful and they can do a lot, but I, I think you really sort of need to be in the STEM field to be able to interpret and, uh, and manipulate that stuff. But, but Excel, it's really visual, it's really transparent. You can see what's going on. There's a, uh, not a lot of ambiguity uh, in the development of an Excel sheet. So they're very easy to interpret. They're, all, they're also very customizable. I mean, you can write an Excel spreadsheet to do anything, to track shipping orders for your company, to make a little check register for your personal bank account. I mean, I have an Excel spreadsheet that I use to track your grades uh, and whatnot. So you can, you can use Excel for, for anything. And, and uh, it, 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 because of that, because of its versatility and its ease of use, it's one of the most popular software packages uh, that's out there. Um, it's good for doing a lot of um, a lot of repeated calculations. So going back to to the grade book example, you know, when when I got all the grades for all the students in the class. So for instance, if I've got your grades, I'm computing your attendance, your homework grades, your test grades, and I'm computing his composite grade in this class. Then I got to compute hers. Then I got to compute his, and then his and his. So it's very nice to do a lot of repetitive calculation, you know, the same calculation over and over and over again. And that's something we tend to experience quite a bit uh, in the world of engineering. You know, if you're doing a, a, a beam design for a given building, well, how many beams are in this building, you know? So once you've designed one beam, it's time to design another and another. So you can write a spreadsheet to design a beam and then just keep using it over and over again. Um, it's really good for processing data, for tabular sets of data. You know, uh, going back to like civil engineering, you know, a lot of road design and a lot of um, traffic engineering is all revolved around the traffic that a particular road experiences. But for instance, you're going to have different traffic controls, let's say on uh, 3rd Avenue right here next to the engineering uh, building, than you are on State Route 37 out in the middle of Wayne County. You know, whole lot less traffic, whole, you know, much different geometry. So one of the things that we'll do as civil engineers is we'll go out and we'll count daily traffic, you know, at given hours of the day, at peak volume times, things like 4 p.m. and 8 a.m. and uh, things like that. So we'll collect a lot of data. We've got to be able to use that data and manipulate that data uh, to do design. Excel works really well for that. <coughs> we can also do graphing, which um, that's very uh, important. We're going to spend a lot of time on not just how to graph in Excel, but how to graph correctly, how to take data and present it in a correct, clearly understandable uh, form. We can also um, do what-if studies. So if I, let's say I'm doing a beam design and I've got a design, let's say I'm checking the, the, the beam and I find it no good. What I might then ask myself is, well, what if I take that beam and make it a little bit deeper? How's that going to affect its design? So all I have to do is change that value and, you know, everything's taken care of. So it's, um, it, it's a pretty powerful tool. Now, it doesn't really, uh, it's, it can't do everything. Um, so thank you. Uh, it won't do symbolic manipulation, like I'm sure some of you have like a, like a TI-89 or something like that, and it'll deal with uh, symbolic manipulation. Uh, Excel won't do that. Um, it will do some basic computer programming algorithms, bless you, uh, but it won't do anything complex. That's where MATLAB and other programming language, uh, languages come into play. But don't get me wrong, by and large, it's a very uh, versatile program. Uh, now, spreadsheets, they've been around for a while. I mean, the first one was released back in the, uh, the late 70s. But I, I want to make it clear that there's a number of options out there. For instance, um, if you all are Mac users, you might have a program like this on your computer. It looks like this called Numbers. Um, it's essentially a, a spreadsheet software. Also, um, I'm, a, I'm an Android guy, so um, I have Google Spreadsheets on my, uh, on my phone. And uh, if you all are working on homework and you send me an email, you say, not, I don't understand. I can't quite get this to work. And I open it on my phone. I'm opening it with, uh, with Google Spreadsheets. So there, there's a number of different options out there for you. But by and large, the, the most common one uh, is Excel. I think they're the ones that sort of, for lack of a better term, I guess they're the ones that kind of got it right in the, uh, in the spreadsheet world. Now, 
One thing I'll point out, if you all have not already done so, I mean, I'm sure most of you have a laptop or a tablet or something like that. If you haven't already put Microsoft Office on your, uh, uh, on your computer, you need to do that now. now now, one thing about, um, uh, one thing about uh, being a student at Marshall is that you get a copy of Microsoft Office for free. And, and, and oh, there you go. Uh, not just um, uh, Excel, but Word, but PowerPoint, uh, and things like that. Um, you, go to, you can go to this website to find it. I also posted a, a little document from Marshall University IT that will walk you through step by step how to, uh, how to install it. By and large, the, the, um, the long and short of it is you can go to this website and follow the instructions, but the long and short of it is you're going to go on to MyMU and then go on to your, your email, and there's a little link, I believe it's in the top left corner, where you just select Office 365 and install your desktop applications, and then there you go. And uh, we got pretty strong Wi-Fi in the building, so I'd do it here because it, uh, it'll download uh, pretty quickly. But yeah, if you haven't already done so, you should do it. Regardless of this class, I mean, having office, I think, is essential to successfully negotiating a college uh, uh, curriculum, regardless of your major. So I I'd go ahead and do that now if you haven't already done so. Um, <coughs> all right. So what I want to do is I want to open up Excel. I want to play around with a little bit. We'll do uh, some basic commands. And uh, I'm going to probably hop back and forth between the, uh, the PowerPoint and actually just uh, using Excel. So if you haven't already done so, go ahead and open Excel uh, on your computers. If it's not on the desktop, you should be able to find it in the Start menu. You, know, you can just go on the bottom left, just go to Start menu, and it's going to be either down here in this menu or it's going to be uh, somewhere up here in this top right corner. I think there's a series of shortcuts for the Office Suite. It's going to be uh, something like this. So does anybody able to find it? Everybody got that? Let's see. Got most people opening it. All right. Once it opens, just go ahead and click blank workbook. Uh, Microsoft has a bunch of standard templates that you, if you want to start uh, a given Excel file, let's say you want to build a, uh, a loan comparison sheet, it already has a template built for you. But we're just going to start off with a blank workbook. So um, everybody got that open? Okay. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through some of the uh, anatomy of just how Excel uh, is laid out. Just a heads up, my Excel looks probably a little differently than yours. I took the font and I blew it up real big so that you all could see what's going on. So you all probably see a whole lot more uh, in your workspace uh, than I do. So speaking of, this area right here with all this grid, this is your workspace. This is where you're actually you know, populating your sheet with data and doing calculations and figures and tables and all that. This is where you're actually doing your work. You can use your mouse. To, uh, to click you know, a given cell to start typing. You can also you know, dr you know, just click and drag and you can select a given range uh, and what have you. Uh, you can also use your arrow keys to, uh, to go up and down and left and right uh, and what have you. Keep in mind, <coughs> um, you know, don't be afraid to ask questions, but also if, if there's something that you miss and you think, oh, I, I, didn't, I didn't catch that, no big deal. Remember, I'm, I'm recording everything, so everything will upload to YouTube sometime uh, later today. And that'll probably be pretty valuable because, um, I mean, just you know, trying to remember where that little formula is. Where, how did he do that average and whatnot? It'll, it'll upload uh, and everything will be there. Okay. <coughs> A couple other things. So right up here where it says, see where it says book one? So everybody see that? That's the, the title bar. So for instance, if, if I have, let's say, um, like Greg's Beam Design file, and I open up Greg's Beam Design, it'll say Greg's Beam Design, so I'll know what, uh, what file I'm working on. Um, this little area up here on the top left, see so you've got that little disk icon, and you all probably have like an undo and a redo, something like that. That's your quick access toolbar. It, uh, that's where you as a user can customize things. Like if I say, you know what, I want the, uh, I want the new file button, you know, easy to find. I can just, you know, drop down and select the new file button, and there you can see it's right there. So you as the user have a little bit of room to customize your, uh, your um, uh, interface the way you want. And a lot of uh, programs uh, like Excel and even programs like AutoCAD and MicroStation, they give you a little bit of uh, flexibility in customizing the interface the way that, uh, that you would like. <coughs> okay, so um, a little bit more. So this region up here is uh, what's called the ribbon. 
So uh, the ribbon is comprised of a series of tabs that have all of the you know, fundamental commands associated with Excel. So for instance, right now I'm on the Home tab. So for instance, if I click, let's say, Data, you'll see that all my commands up here change now in the, uh, the Data tab. Uh, a quick way of going through the tabs is to actually just sort of hover around right here and take your mouse wheel and just sort of scroll and it'll scroll through your, um, through your tabs. I actually don't even like click formulas anymore. I just sort of scroll down. I think it's a little easier and a little, little faster. Um, but yeah, each tab has a specific function. So for instance, the insert tab is where you would insert things like if you want to insert a picture on your uh, uh, spreadsheet or you want to insert a graph or some te uh, text box or things like that. Um, the formulas tab lists all the pre-built formulas that are in Excel, things like um, a trig functions and, and logarithms and financial calculations and sums and averages and things like that. All that stuff's going to be in the formulas tab. Uh, a lot of it, the more you use Excel, you sort of start to remember. Like, for instance, if I want to add things up, I know the command is the sum, command of the sum function. Uh, the more you use Excel, you'll sort of start to pick this stuff up. One of the nice things about uh, a lot of these different spreadsheet um, packages, you know, like Google Spreadsheets versus Excel, is that they all tend to use, by and large, the same formulas. So it's not like you need to memorize one set of formulas for one program and another uh, for a different one. So that's a, that's a pretty nice uh, package or feature of these programs uh, as well. Everybody good so far? OK. <coughs> now. A couple other things, so this little window right here, see where it says B3, that's called the cell cursor. That just tells me what cell I'm on right now. So for instance, if I click cell E5, notice how you know, it changes. Now it tells me what cell uh, I'm working on. Right next to it, you should see this big white space right here. That's called the formula bar. Um, not only can you use that to enter data into a per, uh, particular cell, but it'll show you the contents of that cell, you know, the calculation that's being performed. So one of the nice things about uh, Excel is you have multiple different uh, means of viewing uh, what's going on uh, within a particular cell. Okay, um, last thing that's worth mentioning, I guess, right now, is this thing at the bottom. See where it says Sheet 1? Okay. So this, per when you open up a, an Excel file, you're essentially opening up a, a workbook. And this workbook, for instance, has one big sheet of calculations. If I wanted, I could have two sheets or three sheets. And I can also rename them, you know, whatever, uh, whatever I want. So I could take this sheet, let's say, and I could right click and I could rename it and call it, you know, beam design and then call the next one column design or, or you know, connection design or what have you. So I can have different set of calculations if I just want to separate, okay, here's my traffic counts or here's my circuit analysis or here's my gear design uh, and what have you. I can separate uh, those accordingly. Everybody good so far? Okay. Um, let me rename this. Let me go back to sheet one just so. Oh, goodness gracious. Sheet one. Just so everything matches what you've got uh, in your uh, in your cell. Are we good? Okay. So a little bit on uh, on terminology. So uh, for instance, um, I've been talking about cells and things like that. So if you notice, uh, these spreadsheet programs are discretized into basically just one big table. Okay. What you'll tend to find is that all of your rows in all of these programs are numbered. You know. One, two, three, four, five, and then all of your columns are lettered. So this is column A, column B, column C. So since the question, what happens when you get to Z, you know, and you've run out of letters? Well, they just keep reusing them. So, you know, J, L, M, N, O, P, U, V. So when you get to Z, you know, we start off with A, 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 B, A, C, A, D, and Excel will just keep doing that. Um, in terms of the amount of cells on a given sheet, I mean, it's something like 100,000. You're, you're definitely not going to run out of room on a given uh, Excel file. There's plenty of room. I have never, I, I've been building these files for years now, I've never had a problem where I ran out of room. That, that, that's, that's not an issue uh, at all. Okay. Um, a couple things on, on navigation. So, um, like, like I said, you can use your 
mouse to sort of click and, and drag around. You can also use your arrow keys to go back and forth. One other thing that you can do, for instance, you can hit your home key. If you see your home key on the uh, keyboard, you hit that and it will bring you back to the A column, all the way back to the beginning. If, you, if you're out here and you hit, um, let's say, shift, uh, shift home, it'll select that, uh, that particular region. Control home will bring you all the way back uh, to A1. All right, everybody okay with that? Okay. Um, let's tell you what, let, let's have a little bit of fun. Let's do some, do some calcs and see what we can do with this. So um, what we're going to do is we're going to uh, build some pretty basic calcs and see how we can manipulate them. So you all are students, so I imagine one of the uh, uh, things you're always interested to know is what's your grade in a given class, right? You want to know what your average grade is. Okay. So let, let's compute a, uh, let's just do a basic average calculator to compute your, your average. And th this will help us explore some of the different types of values we can enter in a given Excel sheet. So let's go through and let's just start entering some grades. So I'll go into, let's say, cell B2. And let's just type in grades. So you can, once you click a given cell, you can start typing. If you want, you can click the formula bar and start typing. You can see I've hit grades, and then you go through and you hit enter, okay? Um, you can hit enter or you can click away, whatever you would like, and you should see grades pop up uh, in that cell. Everybody okay with that? Everybody good with that? Okay. Now let's just start listing some grades. Let's just start seeing uh, what's going on. So let's say we're listing some uh, exam grades, but again, remember we don't have uh, exams in this class, right? We have celebrations of learning. So let's say we've got a uh, first exam, we did pretty well, we got a 94. And then uh, second exam, that one didn't go so well, we got a 65. And then third exam, uh, we, we brought it back a little bit, we got an 82. And then we got our fourth exam, oh, we got our fourth exam and uh, about average, let's say we got a 76, something like that, right? So I just entered those values and I kept hitting enter. Now, does anybody notice something about the difference between how the numbers look and how the text looks? Anybody see that? See how the numbers sort of got hugged over to the right and then the, the text got hugged over to the left? Everybody see that? Okay, there is a difference between how Excel interpre interprets numerical data and how it interprets text. Excel interprets text as just a label. It's just, okay, here's some uh, text to label what's going on, and it really doesn't consider that a, a value that you would use for computations. Once you start entering in a number, Excel goes, okay, now we need to start uh, uh, doing, some, uh, uh, doing some math with that. And one of the ways that Excel indicates to you as the user that that uh, cell contains numerical data is the, the data is hugged over to the right. So that'll give you kind of an idea uh, of what's going on. Sound good? Okay. Now, now, what I want to do right now is let's go ahead and let's compute the average. Okay. Now, the th there's three uh, quantities that you can put in a cell. You can put a label, you can put a value, and then you can put a formula. Now, as soon, the, the way you enter a formula is you start off by typing the equal sign, okay? And once you type the equal sign, Excel goes, okay, now we're doing some calculations. So everything from then on, Excel's going to treat that as if it's a formula, as if you're doing calculations. Now, I, I don't expect you to remember every single uh, formula command that's in Excel. Later on, we'll provide you with a little guide as we start doing some more uh, complex calcs. But... To, but one thing I will say about Excel is a lot of the commands are pretty easy to uh, remember and understand. For instance, if I want to compute the average, I say equals average. Okay? And you'll notice as you start typing, you'll see some of the formulas are starting to pop up. And for instance, we have an average command, we have an average if command, and we'll start to dig into those uh, later. But right now I want to do an average. Now, with a lot of these functions, you require um, sort of some arguments that go inside them, kind of like f of x, you know how you have your function and then your parentheses f of x. It's kind of the same thing. We're taking the average of some data, okay? Now what I'm going to do right here is instead of typing in the numbers, instead of saying I want to take the average of 94, 65, 82, and 76, I'm going to say 
let's take the average of whatever's going on in cells, what, B3 all the way to B6. Everybody see that? So the way that I would enter that is I would say B3, and then you'd use a colon, B6. Okay, and you'll notice when you enter that in, that range sort of highlights. And don't worry, we're going to uh, look at uh, a few different ways uh, of doing that, uh, that type of calculation. All right, any time that you have a formula, if you have a, a left parenthesis, you have to have a right one. So ultimately, you should have a, a, a formula that looks something like this. Has everybody got that? Everybody got that? Good. Okay. When you press Enter, let's see, it should report an average score of 79.25. So based on all those uh, uh, tests, no, celebrations of learning, um, we got a, a, an average grade of 79.25. Now right off the bat, one of the beauties uh, of Excel is, you know, I, I went to, to Dr. Michelson and I asked him about that grade on exam two, and he's like, I sh shouldn't give him a 65, it should have been a 70, or maybe it should have been a 40. No. Get everybody laughing in the morning. One of the things you can do is you can change one of the values. Say, oh, that wasn't supposed to be a 65, that was supposed to be a 70. Well, and then now your average updates, okay? So you can use Excel to continuously do these calculations, and you can also change the inputs pretty easily to get a different answer. See, if you were using, you know, like the Casio or something, it wouldn't really work like that. You know, as soon as I screw up and change your grade from a 65 to a 70, now if you were using the Casio, you'd have to compute your average all over again. Here, once you've got the spreadsheet set up, uh, that's it. You know, you just change the value, uh, and there you go. All right. So does that sound good? Anybody got any questions about that? All right. <clears throat> I want to do over here. I want to do some basic calculations because I want to show you a couple different ways that you can do uh, some pretty basic uh, entries. So let's do something simple. Okay. Let's just add a couple values. Okay. So let's just add the 94 and the 70, okay? And let's look at a number of different ways that we can do that in terms of setting up the formula, how we uh, enter it, how we use the keyboard uh, and the mouse, uh, et cetera. Now, one way of doing that is to literally just type out equals 94 plus 70. And Excel will do that. It will, uh, it will manipulate those numbers uh, directly. So we can just do that and then we get 164, okay? Now, that's one way of doing it. Another way of doing it is to refer to the cells. So we can say, all right, equals B3 plus B4. Okay? Everybody see that? One of the nice things about um, Excel is that if you're referring to multiple uh, different cells, not only will it highlight those, but it highlights them in a different color. So for instance, the first cell I'm referring to is in this sort of blue tinted color, and the second one's kind of this orangish red color. If I added another one and I said, you know, plus B5, it shows up, you know, kind of purple, and then I think the next one shows up green, uh, uh, and et cetera. B4. Right. Sound good? Okay. Now, if you don't like typing out that, you know, equals B3 plus B4, you can use your mouse to, and your keyboard to make things a little easier. For instance, I hit the equals button to start developing a formula, and then instead of hitting the letter B and hitting the number three, I can use the mouse and literally just click that cell, and notice how it's populated the formula with B3. So I say, okay, B3 plus B4, all right? Everybody say that? See that? You can just use the mouse, so it's a lot less uh, typing and whatnot. Okay. Everybody good? All right. Another way that I can do that is I can say equals, and then instead of using the mouse, I can use the arrow keys and just go up and find it. So I can say, look, there's B3 plus B4. Okay? Sound good? Now, another way of going about that is to not even use addition, you know, the, the plus sign, and actually use one of the functions. So if I'm trying to add up a bunch of terms in Excel, I'm just curious, what type of function do you think I would want, want to use? A sum function. There we go. All right. So I could do equals sum 
of, I can do that a couple different ways. I could highlight that region. I could do that, and then hit enter, and then close it with the parentheses. Excuse me. I could hit equals sum of, and instead of dragging, I could just say sum of that cell, comma, that cell. So, you know, I it, just taking the sum of whatever are the contents in cell B3 and then whatever the contents are in cell B4 instead of uh, that range. Another way I can go about this is to say equals the sum of, that. watch this, I can use my arrow keys to get to 94 and then if you hold the shift button, you can go down. So I can, you know, have a sum of everything that's in that, that big range, but instead all I care about is those two. And it will still give you 164. Alright, sound good? And right now you might think, well, gosh, there's but, you know, six or seven different ways to do a sum. That's just complicated. That's really sort of the wrong way of looking at it. Really the best way of looking at it is that Excel will allow you to enter these calculations in whatever way you feel comfortable and as long as you're following you know basic mathematical principles remember the whole please excuse my dear Aunt Sally and as long as you're following you know that order of operations it'll work and it will interpret it accordingly so you know it, it's a pretty powerful package now I'm curious does anybody see this anybody see this little green triangle on there is anybody getting that okay one of the other nice uh, benefits of Excel is it tries to do its best to, um, uh, to do a little bit of error checking for you. Sometimes it's valid, sometimes it's not. Um, if you hover over this, and you go here, there's a little warning sign. What it's saying is that the formula in this cell refers to a range that has additional numbers adjacent to it. So what Excel's trying to say is, well, wait a minute. You, you're adding these two numbers, but wait a minute, there's all these numbers down here. Did you really want to add all of them? So it's just trying to give you a warning like, hey, make sure you know you check this and see whether or not what you're doing is right. Sometimes it's a, a useful warning, sometimes it's not. Sometimes, no, I only want to add the 94 and the 70. So you can just ignore it. Uh, that's fine. Sound good? Now, some of the uh, errors are a little more valid. So for instance, if I do if I go over here and I say, all right, I have two, and then I have zero. Bless you. So what's going to happen if I say equals and I say two divided by zero? Well, there's a problem there, right? We all know that division by zero is, uh, is undefined because nothing times zero will give you a two, right? So Excel will, will uh, interpret that uh, accordingly. Everybody good so far? Any questions? Okay, all right. Now, I want to show you something else, and this is going to get into, I'm going to delete all this, so I'm just going to highlight all this and literally just hit the delete button and it goes away. Okay, <laughs> I want to play around with um, a, a very fundamental concept uh, in Excel um, about the difference between what's called relative addressing and absolute addressing. Now, it sounds complicated, it, it really isn't. It's actually a pretty uh, simple idea. Okay, so what I'm going to do is this. I'm going to take the data and the calculations that is in this range of cells. So I just use my mouse and just sort of drug along this range. So I've got all that highlighted. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to replicate it somewhere else. So I'm going to copy and paste it. Now there, there's two ways of copying and pasting. You can use uh, these uh, uh, commands that you see it uh, here under the home tab or you can use what what, what I use uh, more often than not which are these right here these right here these are will, will save you an incredible amount of time uh, during a lot of uh, editing you know, spreadsheets and documents and things like that and that's the the keyboard shortcuts for cut copy and paste so if you notice on the bottom of the keyboard you'll see a little control button um, some of these you might already know, like for instance, if you highlight a bunch of text and you hit Control and B, it'll make that text bold, or Control and I, it'll make that text uh, italicized. Um, control X, C, and V are just shortcuts for cut, copy, and paste, and they're incredibly uh, quick commands. So for instance, if I'm on my Excel sheet and I've got the range highlighted that I want, 
I can just literally hit control C and you'll notice that Excel has copied it because you should have sort of a, a dancing dashed line going on around that range. Everybody see that? And then we'll take this and we'll move it, I don't know, somewhere like right here. So we'll put it right here. We'll say control V and notice how it copied that, uh, that, that data. Everybody see that? Now, here's the interesting part. It didn't just copy the text and it didn't just copy the numbers. It also copied the formulas, but it changed them a little bit. Let, let's take a look at that. So if I use my mouse or my arrows, however you would like, and I go to this formula, I read the formula bar and it says that that cell equals the average of B3 to B6. Everybody see that? Now I copied and pasted. Everything should be identical, but what's going on over here? It reads something different. It says E4 to E7. See that? What we have here is an example of what's called relative addressing. When you copy and paste a formula or move a formula from one region to another, unless you tell Excel to do otherwise, and we'll talk about how here in a second, but unless you tell Excel to do otherwise, Excel will address those formulas relatively uh, based on the range they were originally defined for. And that's just a fancy way of saying that I took this cell and what did I do? I moved it, what, one, two, three over and I moved it one down. So you'll notice the ranges moved accordingly. So for instance, this original range was from B3 to B6. So all along the B column. If I go three columns over, that's C, D, and E, notice how the column is referring to E, right? If I go down one row, instead of going from three to six, I'm going from four to seven. So Excel, as you copy and paste formulas, will move those ranges uh, accordingly. And that's pretty valuable. You know, like for somebody like me, for instance, if I do a, a grade book, I'll set up a row where I'm computing Mr. Smith's uh, homework averages and then his quiz averages and uh, uh, attendance averages and whatnot, and then I have his grade. And all I've got to do is copy that formula down for every other student, and then it computes accordingly. Instead of referring back to that same range, it's just going down accordingly. Sound good? Now. By and large, that's a really powerful prospect in Excel, but sometimes you don't want that to happen. Look, here, here's a good example. How many physics students I got in here? All right, so you all uh, in physics know that one of the most fundamental values that you use in just about every problem in that class is G, acceleration due to gravity, right? So let's say I've got a, a, a you know, projectile uh, motion problem. So I've got a, a ball and, and I took it and I threw it like that. So it's got that, you know, parabolic motion, right? And so I'm trying to compute a whole bunch of different things. You know, what's its velocity here? What's its position here? What's its, its uh, uh, downward acceleration, which is, of course, always g at some point. Um, but I'm trying to compute all these different values. I've got all these different computations going on, but it's the same g. g didn't change, right? G is always 9.81 meters per second squared, right? So what I might have in my Excel sheet is I might say, all right, you know, right here, let's say in cell H3, let's say I build my spreadsheet and I've got 9.81. And I do a whole bunch of calculations, but I always want it to stay right there. If I always want that reference to stay on cell H3, instead of moving around like that average calc did just a moment ago, that would be an example of absolute addressing as opposed to relative addressing. So let me pull something up on PowerPoint real quick. <clears throat> All right. So relative addressing is when you, if you take a range and you move it, the formula will move along with it. You know, it'll go along with the rows, go along with the columns, uh, et cetera. So this is just a, another example looking at that. We'll, we'll actually, we'll go back to that here in a second because I'm going to mess around with this data here in a little bit. Um, absolute addressing is when we want to lock a cell into place. Now, if you're ever looking at computations, you, know, you look at the formula bar, and you see dollar signs, those dollar signs are trying to lock that value into place. So 
let's sort of let's sort of play around with this a little bit. Let, let's go to our gravity example. So <clears throat> this cell right here is my acceleration due to gravity, and everybody remembers that, right? So let's that's a really important value. In fact, I'm going to indicate that it's a really important value, and I'm going to highlight it. So if you notice here on that home tab, you've got, you know, I can change the font, I can change the, whether it's bold or italicized. See this little paint bucket that's got a yellow on it? I'm going to take it and bam. Now that cell is yellow, okay? And I know that I want that, um, I want that uh, cell to remain where it is. It's just sort of a visual indicator that that's gravity and that uh, value isn't going to change. Everybody good? Now let's let's enter a, a few different values. Let me let me delete this. I'm just going to highlight that and delete it, just so I got a little bit of room to work with. Let's do a a, a, a basic calculation. Let's see. Uh, let's just keep it simple. So I'm going to create a column of times. Let's say so. Time zero seconds, one seconds, two seconds, three seconds, etc. And then I'm going to say for each of those times, let's just multiply by gravity and see what the velocity is. Right. And we'll take acceleration, multiply it by time, that'll give you a uh, velocity. So we'll say I've got a column of times. Now, here's, here's a, a nifty little trick. So one thing I can do is, let's say I want to enter in the following data. So 0, 1, 2, 3, <coughs> excuse me, 4. Okay. Now that is one way to enter that data, literally just type it out. Okay. Another way is to use a really nifty shortcut called the uh, fill handle. Let me explain what, what's going on with that. So let me, let me clear out a few of these. I'm just using my arrow keys and hitting delete. Okay, so I'm going to highlight just sort of those two. Okay, now do you notice on your cell, see how you got this little solid square right there? Everybody see that? Okay, watch this. See my cursor? See how it's this sort of white, sort of thickened plus symbol? Watch what happens <clears throat> when I take my mouse and I just sort of slowly move right there. See how it goes from that to, to that? See how you got that sort of solid black plus sign right like that? Everybody see that? Watch what happens when I drag it down. See that? It fills in. What is it's looking at these two numbers and it's uh, it's identifying that the increment between them is one and it just keeps adding. It's a lot like that uh, that table command that we did in the Casio. Remember how we said you got you, we start at negative two and we end at six and then the step is one half so it would just you know fill in accordingly. So bringing it back to the Casio, if I had let's say negative two, whoop, negative two, and then I had negative 1.5, so it's jumping in increments of a half. I could highlight those two and see, look what it's doing. See, it's filling it in in those increments. So it's a really nifty little shortcut to, uh, to move through that. Sound good? All right, so here's an absolute uh, address. So let's go back, let's keep it basic. Let's go to that 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. So 0, 1, then I'll highlight those and drag. Is everybody able to do that? Everybody able to do that? Any questions on that? Okay, so, so watch what's going on. So I want to compute a table of velocities. So here's my velocities, and here's how I want to do this. I want to take each one of those numbers, and I want to multiply them by 9.81. Now, watch what I'm going to do. So I'm going to say equals the time, and then to multiply, you use the asterisk, and there's two ways of doing that. You can do either shift 8, it's right above the number 8, or you can do what I do, and I just have the number pad turned on, and you can see that there's an asterisk button right there. I think that's a little easier. So we'll say equals that, then we'll say times gravity. So what's the result of this calculation going to be if I got 9.81 times 0? It's just going to be... Zero, right? So hit enter and there you go. Sound good? Now, if I use that fill handle, it's going to do the same thing. It's going to take that formula and it's going to drag it down. But the problem is if I do that, they're all going to be zero. 
Now, now why is that? Let, let's look at the formulas as we go down, okay? Here I've got E5 times H3, so I'm taking this times that. But when I drag that formula down, Excel didn't know that I wanted to keep this sitting still, so it's saying that times that, and that times that, and that times that. And there's nothing in these cells, so it still thinks it's everything, all these times times zero, right? So here's something I can do. What I can do is I say, you know what? I don't want that H3 to move at all. I want gravity to sit still. So what I can do is I can go to this gravity cell, and I can enter a dollar sign here and a dollar sign here, and it will lock that in place. So when I take this and I drag it down, whoop, where's the whole thing? There we go. Now it's doing what I wanted it to do because, yeah, the time reference, that's going down from this cell to this cell to this cell to this one, but that one, that one didn't move. Does that make sense? Any questions? Now, I'm lazy. I don't like typing dollar signs all over the place. There's a, a really simple way of, uh, of going about this. So one simple way of going about this is if I go back to, let me delete all these. So I'm just going down using my arrow keys and hitting delete. If I retype this formula, so equals this times that, a quick way of locking that cell into place is if you look on the top of your keyboard, you've got the function button, you know, F1, F2. What you do is this. Highlight that, uh, that H3. You can do it here or in your formula bar. It doesn't matter. And then hit F4. When you hit F4, see how the dollar signs pop up? So I'm, I'm lazy, so that's what I do because I don't like, I can do that a whole lot faster than, than typing all those dollar signs out. And then there you go. Sound good? Any questions? All right. Now, one thing to point out, um, this reference that you see right here, this dollar $H, dollar $3, you put in both of those dollar signs because you want to lock in the column and lock in the row. So, for instance, if I keep hitting F4, this is locking the cell into place. So, if I hit F4 again, notice how that first one left? What this reference is saying is that if I move that formula all over the place, the column will move, but it will always stay on row three. Make sense? If I hit it again, you'll see the dollar sign flip, and now I can move it around all over the place, but the column will always remain column H, and the rows will change up and down. So it'll go to H4, H5, H6, but it'll always stay on, on column H. And if I hit it one more time, it goes back to a relative address. Sound good? Any questions? All right. Let's see. So I put here a little, um, a little just reference for you in the notes. So C2, that would be a relative address of C2. If I put a dollar sign C2, that would essentially mean that the C is locked. So anytime I move that formula, it will remain on column C. If the dollar sign's before the two, anytime I move that formula, it will stay on row two. And if it's dollar C, dollar two, it ain't going anywhere. All right? Sound good? Now, here's another quick example uh, of a of, of valuable um, application of that, and that's a running total. So let's say I'm doing some measurements. I don't know. Let's say I'm trying to design some water management systems. Let's say I've got a creek that's overflowing and I'm trying to determine what's the best way to, to manage that, that flow. So I go out at various times of the day and I'm trying to determine well, what's the flow in that creek at various times. So let's say on, on Monday I take five measurements and then on Tuesday I take six measurements and on Wednesday I take four, uh, etc. A very good example of a, uh, an absolute address is to compute a running total. So, so for instance, all right, so on Monday, if I took five measurements, that means I've taken five total on that, you know, for that week. So if all I've done is Monday's measurements, I've taken five. On Tuesday, if I took another six measurements, that means a running total would be 11. So adding these two up, that would be 11. And then another four on Wednesday would make a total of 15. Another two on Thursday would make a total of 17. Does, it, does that make sense? Everybody okay with that? 
So what I can do is I can use Excel to create a running total. So I can say, all right, let's go into Excel. So I'll go on another sheet just to leave all this stuff here. So what were my measurements? They were like five, six, uh, was it two, four, and three? So six, four, two, three. All right. So <laughs> what I can do is I can create a running total pretty easily by, by doing the following. I can say, all right, we're going to equal the sum of the following range. And this is going to sound a little strange, but bear with me. We're going to say equals the sum of C3 to C3. Okay? Now, obviously, if I just do that calc right here, it's just going to give me 5, right? Because it's just going to say, what's the sum of 5? It's just 5. But let's also keep in mind what I want to do with that. I want to take that cell and I want to drag it down. Now, the way I'm going to get this to work is as follows. I'm going to take this cell, this first one, and I'm going to lock it. So I'm going to say dollar sign, dollar sign right here. Okay? So your formula should look something about like this. Now, if I hit enter, it's going to give me 5. If I drag it down, it gives me that running total. Now, let's, let's explain why it gives me that running total. So here I've got the sum of just C3, so it's 5. But as I drag that down, that second cell went along with it, so C4, and then the next one goes down as C5 and C6 and C7. But that first one stayed where it was. So, for instance, if I look at this, it's just adding all those up down. Does that sound good? Anybody got any questions? This is good stuff. I, I have a, a lot of fun doing stuff like this. All right. Any other questions? All right. I do have one other, I guess, sort of big ticket item I want to uh, discuss with you today. Uh, and that's a little bit uh, about formatting, specifically with uh, uh, just regular formatting, but also conditional formatting. Because I think conditional formatting is, uh, is something that isn't really used a lot, but it's incredibly powerful. So. Um, let me sort of explain what's going on with, uh, with this conditional formatting. While I'm doing that, if you go onto Blackboard, you should see a little Excel file that says something like conditional formatting for students. Does everybody see that? It should be right there under Excel 8 or Lecture Notes 8. Everybody see that? You should be able to download that pretty easily. And what you should get is a, uh, a table of what says compressive strengths. It should look something, uh, it should look something like this, but there, uh, there's no color in the data. It should just be all white here. Does everybody see that? Okay, so let me at least just give you a little bit of a, a background into, uh, into what's going on with the, um, uh, with the data. So um, let me just give you just a little bit of a civil engineering aspect. So, one of the things that we civil engineers need to do is we need to assess the properties of the materials that we use for construction. And the same thing's true for mechanical engineers or even electrical engineers. It's just you may be looking at different materials and different properties. So I'm a civil engineer, so one of the materials that I use quite a bit is concrete. Okay? Now concrete, whether you like it or not, it's just a material that is highly variable. You know, you can mix one element of concrete or one batch of concrete and test 20 different cylinders and you'll get 20 different sets of data. And what we try and do in the world of engineering is just do our best to use the average, you know, or use the, the, the maybe even the lower bound or the upper bound uh, and whatnot. So what I've got here, uh, let me pull this, let me open this Excel file up. Uh, it should look something like this. Let's see if it opens. Uh, it's chugging away. While that's opening up, what you're seeing is the results of a bunch of tests that look something like this. One of the fundamental um, tests that we do in, uh, in civil engineering is we do a concrete cylinder test. So for a given batch of concrete, we will produce a, a, a cylinder. There's a set of specifications that we follow. They're usually about 6 inches in diameter, about 12 inches tall. And we take them and we put them under a large hydraulic press and we just press those suckers until they fail. Okay, and what will happen is you'll get something that looks like this. So let me close this. I think my computer's being a little touchy with me. 
So. All right. So I'll go ahead and hit enable editing. If your if your uh, um, computer pops up with an enable editing, just click that. That's just Excel's way of just making sure you don't make any changes you don't want to make. We'll go ahead and click uh, enable editing. What you should see is a bunch of compressive strengths for a bunch of samples. So th this doesn't really have much to do with what we're talking about here, but concrete is one of those materials that get stronger over time. So we're testing these cylinders at different ages of their, uh, of their life. So for instance, if we look at sample one, notice how um, after two days, the concrete's uh, exhibiting a compressive strength of 2,830 uh, PSI. So that's how much pressure it took to fail that cylinder. But over time, uh, it's getting stronger. So after seven days, it's 3,505. And then for design, we always use 28-day strength, uh, so we would use, let's say, 4,470 PSI. But you'll notice there's, it's variable all over the place. Now, I, I don't know about you, but I've got to be honest. I'm having a hard time interpreting some patterns with this data. It's just a bunch of numbers, you know. Maybe I can create some visual cues to make this uh, a little easier. And that's where conditional formatting comes into play. So what I might do is I might say, you know what, let's take all the values that are within a given range and let's make them green. Or let's take some of the other values and make them blue or, or yellow or red or what have you. It, it's, um, uh, it's a pretty powerful tool. Like, for instance, if, if I'm doing a grade book, I make, make all the grades that are A's green and all the B's blue and all the C's yellow. So it tells me, you know, it gives me a visual cue of what's going on. All right, so one of the things I might do is I might say, all right, let's highlight all these 28-day strengths. So I'm actually going to zoom out. You can zoom out if you hold the control button and just use your wheel mouse. You can zoom out a little bit. I'm zooming out a little bit just so I can have the whole range on screen, but you can probably see it all because your font's a, a little better than mine. Again, I blew mine up just so you all can read everything. If you look on the ribbon, you should have a little button that says conditional formatting. Does everybody see that? So what I might do is I say, okay, conditional formatting. I've got all those cells already highlighted. You've got to make sure you have those highlighted. And let's, let's create some rules. Let's say, you know what? I, I see some values that are kind of around 4,000, 5,000, some 3,000. So let's do this. Let's do less than, okay? And we'll say that any cell that's less, say less than 4,000, so type in 4,000, and let's make those cells red. So those are the really weak batches of concrete. So light red with dark red text. And hit OK. And what you should get is something like this. There's four cells, like it's sample number 11, 17, 21, and 25. Those are the weak samples, right? Everybody see that? So you should get that. So Let's also, let's do this. Let's take all the really good samples and let's indicate them accordingly. So let's take all the samples, let's say, that are over 5,000 and let's make them, let's say, green. So we'll um, do the same thing. We'll go to conditional formatting. We'll say, let's go to highlight cell rules, let's say, greater than. And any of the cells that are greater than 5,000, let's drop down here and let's make those green. And you can also, you can do whatever you want. You can make purple cells with orange text or, you know, whatever you want, um, just as long as, um, uh, you know, it, it would be a good thing to make sure everything's pretty scattered. You know, you don't want like a light purple and a dark purple. You just, I mean, the whole point is to make it visible so you can see what's going on. So we'll say green fill, and you'll see, okay, now we got a little bit better idea of what's going on. Now you can see some of those cells or some of that data has got some really good compressive strength. Some of it's not so good. And the nice thing is you start changing the data, the formatting will update accordingly. So it gives you sort of a visual cue of what's going on. If I want it, and there's, I mean, hosts of rules. It's really just worth playing around and, and, uh, and, and taking a look at. I can say, all right, let's do all the cells between, so between 4,000 and 5,000. So we'll say, let's say between 4,000. And I'm just using my mouse and clicking and, you know, highlighting, say, 5,000. We'll make those, let's say, yellow. I'm just using one of the pre-built ones. So there you go. You, say you, got, you, know, you have sort of a visual idea of what's going on. You, know, you can see the ranges. So it gives you, okay, most of them are around the 4,000 4 to 5,000 range in PSI. You know? 
You, know, you, don't, you don't really need much math with it. You just take a look at it and say, okay, now I've got a visual idea of what's going on. Okay? Does that make sense? Um, one other thing I think, I guess, is, is, uh, is worth mentioning is naming uh, ranges. You know, if you have a particular range of, um, if you have a particular range of data that you really are going to manipulate quite a bit and you really just want to mess with that quite a bit, you can actually name a range in a table the way you would want. So here's a for instance. Let's say I highlight this. Everybody sort of highlight all that. So I am highlighted all that data, the two day, the seven day, and the 28 days, and I've got all this. See where it, up here, up top, see where it says C4? I'm going to change the name. I'm actually going to type something out. Let's call it cylinder data, okay? So, or data. Now, when you type out these names, the ranges have to begin with a letter, and I've got a little slide on here on this. They have to begin with a letter. They can't have any spaces, but you can use uh, uh, underscores and, and numbers and things like that. And you can't, like, you can't name something D5 because there's already a cell called D5. But the idea is to name it something unique and something that you understand. So this is cylinder data. Okay? So I can hit enter. And now this book knows that that range is cylinder data. So I can go over, let's say over here, and I could say, well, what if I want to know the average? Instead of doing the average of that range, I can say equals average of cylinder data. And it already knows what I'm talking about. You know what I mean? Because I went and defined, I said, that is the range that I'm interested in. That is my, my key data set, and it's important to me, so I'm calling it cylinder data. Okay? Is everybody okay with that? And again, you'll notice, you'll, you'll notice this here. I, I sort of soft-pedaled this a little bit, but you'll notice as you start to type this out, like here, let me delete that. As you start to type it, if I C, Y, L, look, it already recognized the cylinder data was there, so I could just double-click that, and... It pops in, then hit enter. So my average compressive strength over all those tests was about 3,700 PSI. So then that would be the value. If I was using that concrete, I'd say, this is how thick that slab needs to be. This is how deep that beam needs to be, because that's the material I'm using, and I want to design that slab so that, uh, so that grandma doesn't fall in the river. All right. Well, that's true. All right. Any questions? All right, so he, here's what I'm going to do. So real quick, uh, let me pull up the, uh, the homework assignment um, just to give you all kind of an idea of what's going on. So I, I handed out hard copies of this a little bit ago, but you all have did Yes, sir? What's that? Well, I'll say this. I, my, uh, my sheet, uh, because I'm, I'm using a display screen, like I've got my standard font to be like 22, so it's showing up a lot bigger probably. Than, than it is on yours. So because of that, the number might show up a little lower. But that's a good question. Let me also show you something real quick. So the question was about significant figures. Um, Excel really doesn't keep track of significant figures. It just sort of does the calcs. But if you want more or less precision, you can control that. And let me show you an easy way of doing that. Does everybody see on the home tab, do you see right here where it says number? And you've got general and you've got dollar sign, percentage. Everybody see that? Okay, see these little zero buttons? These zero buttons will tell you, um, uh, will tell you how many decimal points, or it will uh, fix the display based on a given amount of precision. And the easiest way is to just show you. So if I hit the left one, look what it's doing. See how it's extending the number of decimals? Like I want you know, seven decimal places or eight decimal places. If I pick the one on the other end, it'll start to shrink it down. You know? So that's four, and then that's three, and then that's two. And let me say that that is incredibly important when you're actually doing some real calcs. I mean, we've had, uh, for instance, we've had senior design presentations, and they did all their math in Excel, and then, you know, they're, they're presenting their, their results, and they, they have a, a $50 million off, uh, commercial office building that they're designing, and they've got their math accurate to the penny. If you can estimate a $50 million project to the penny, uh, that's pretty good. Uh, <laughs> honestly, what you're going to want to do is round that down to the nearest dollar or, or heck, even the nearest thousand dollars. Your, your estimate is not going to be that good. 
So having that appropriate amount of precision, uh, that matters. I mean, if I'm looking at cylinder data, like cylinder test data, I would never tell somebody that it's, oh, the average is 3698.2083333 PSI. I, I would never do that. Uh, because you can't hang your hat on that level of precision. I would go into my Excel sheet and say, nah, let's just call it 3698. Because that's, with reasonable certainty, I can state that. That's a good point you're bringing up. Any other questions? This is good stuff. Everybody good? All right, so real quick, um, I'm going to just briefly go through the homework assignment. So I have a, a table in Excel that uh, I'm basically asking you all to reproduce, and it's a really simple one, and I'm just basically asking, I've got some formulas, and if you start moving those formulas around, what's the result that you get? So it, it should be pretty, uh, pretty straightforward. I'm also going to have you take this table and reproduce uh, it, it, it in Excel, you know, name it table one, and then do some conditional formatting so it has a, a, a given color scheme based on the data that go into it. The rest of the homework is going to be uh, uh, revolving uh, around an in-class exercise that we're going to do next time. We're going to create an Excel template together. It's going to be uh, what, what we're calling a slab calculator, basically uh, based on a given uh, weight of concrete and dimensions you can have a, a really quick uh, estimate of how heavy that slab is going to be. So we're going to do that together next time. Um, as for submissions, this assignment is not going to be on paper. It's really just going to be submitting uh, Excel files. Um, our IT guy is working on developing a, a network drive for all of you. So literally, you'll be able to go and find your name and just copy paste, and then that's it. Um, so he, he's a little, uh, he's got a lot on his plate right now, so he hasn't gotten to it yet. When he does, I'll post some instructions on here's how to do it. And when you all turn it in next week, we'll all be here together. I mean, if it comes unto it, you can just uh, email it to me. But um, the only other thing I guess I'll mention is if you haven't already done so, probably a good idea to get a flash drive or maybe something like a Dropbox account just to start storing your files. Because we're going to have a lot of files that need to be stored. And the last thing you want to do is have them lost. So uh, it would be a good idea to have those, uh, uh, those types of uh, storage capabilities on hand. Sound good? All right. That's all I got. I'm going to let you all sort of chug away for a few minutes at, at your homework. Again, a lot of this will be pretty quick and we'll carry this on next time. That's all I got. Get the lights turned back on.